All right, so we are at 5.30, um, so I'm going to get started right away because um, we got lots of stuff to cover, and um, yeah, let's dive in. Um, so my name's Sean Daig. I'm a, a senior software engineer at the IBM Linux Technology Center. Um, you may also know me from the community. Um, I'm the, the PTL for the QA program for OpenStack. Um, and plus two on Nova and DevStack and a bunch of other things. So if you ever tried to land a DevStack patch, um, I probably commented on it at some point um, and maybe on some other projects as well. Um, the talk today is, uh, is Jenkins failed my patch, now what? Um, we do a lot of interesting, complicated things in our continuous integration system when it comes to the kind of rigorous testing that we send people through. And as a first-time contributor, um, the first time you push code up there, um, you will inevitably have your patch failed by Jenkins. Um, and then it is often confusing the first time, what is it that you are supposed to do to, get, to solve that problem? Um, what I am going to attempt to do today is break down a lot of the things, the kinds of tests, the classes of tests that we do within our gate. Um, and how you would actually resolve an issue in any of these, um, a roadmap to be able to successfully um, make it past our first line of defense um, in preventing bad code from landing in OpenStack. Um, this is the workflow for OpenStack. Um, it's available on the wiki. Uh, I actually am the one that drew this diagram and put it on the wiki. Um, and the basic workflow around Garrett is that we've got um, you know, all our code is in Git somewhere. Um, you work on a local Git repository. You push it up. There's Garrett review. And we do a bunch of automation around this. Um, what we are talking about today, there's a whole lot of complexity around here. Um, we are talking about just this piece. Um, when, uh, when code pushes to Garrett, it immediately kicks off a set of jobs that go in and verify the code. Um, and Garrett will, and Jenkins will return in less than an hour um, some uh, plus one or minus one on your code. Um, and um, again, if you're, a, if you're a new developer, that will most likely be a minus one because you will have inevitably tripped over something that we try to prevent. Um, you don't just get minus one. Um, you get a little more feedback than this. This is what uh, a Garrett post by Jenkins looks like. Um, up here, there will be a scoring section at the top. I sort of snipped out pieces of a Garrett review page. Um, but then down below, you will see a post that says, this doesn't work. Here's some detailed documentation in maybe going and figuring out what's wrong. Here's everything we just ran, and what worked and what didn't work, and timings. These are all hot links, and those hot links take you into our log system and um, let you start digging into what the results were in detail. Um, this is a, was a Nova patch uh, from last night, I think. I, I just grabbed this. Um, so this is a, Nova runs probably more jobs than any other project within OpenStack. Um, but depending on the project, you'll see like, you know, four to a dozen jobs here. And they're of different classes. Um, so what I'm going to talk about now is kind of walking through what some of those classes of jobs are and some of the common failure scenarios, and then, um, and then you know, how, you, how you get through them. Um, realizing that not all projects implement all these things, so um, you know, some parts be, are more applicable than others. Um, the first class of failures that happens um, are actually requirements uh, for the project. So, Every, all the OpenStack projects are written in Python. <clears throat> they all can define underlying Python requirements um, as part of their bootstrapping mechanism. What are, the, what are the things that they require? And here's the problem, is that we don't just care about one OpenStack project working. At the end of the day, you have to build a cloud, which means you have to have all the OpenStack projects, all the integrated OpenStack projects working together at the same time. Due to limitations of Python's packaging system itself, you can only have one version of a Python library in your global namespace 
at a time. So it's actually really important that all the projects can function on some set of requirements. Um, we used to manage this in a very ad hoc manner. And when we had five integrated projects, that was manageable. When we had seven, it was manageable but painful. We're at nine integrated projects. This is no longer um, manually manageable. Um, so I actually spent a bunch of time over the summer helping automate what we do here. And we have a separate, a whole separate OpenStack project, which is just the list of requirements. If you want to update a requirement in a project, you have to go and update it in global requirements first. And that has to be approved. And the approvers on that include basically the project technical leads for all the projects. So they have some idea that this is a reasonable or unreasonable piece of software to include, as well as some of the Linux distributors. So they can say, for technical or license reasons, that software is not shippable. We can't make that a dependency of OpenStack. Um, this uh, was an instance, I think, from last week where someone you know, tried to land an incompatible local requirements change, and we, we check and said, that's no good. Um, this one will not happen to you very often, but when it ha does happen, it's very cryptic, which is the reason that I wanted to stick it in there. Um, Next up is things that will happen all the time. We enforce style guidelines with, uh, with software. So OpenStack is about half a million lines of code in Python. Um, and in the Havana release, we had over 900 developers land some code in OpenStack. Um, when you have half a million lines of code over nine integrated projects, it is really important that there is some consistency across them so that the context switching of understanding code in different projects is not huge. Um, Python itself has a set of best practices called PEP8. Um, OpenStack has a set of extensions to that, um, which we call hacking, um, which are sort of based on both the, like the Google Python style guide as well as Things that we have found over time, if we let in the code base, the code becomes less manageable. And so we kick them out. This, is, um, this entire rule set is managed in this project called Hacking, um, which is available actually from PyPy itself. And um, it will hit you on white space issues. It'll hit you on some of the like function naming issues. It'll hit you on um, ambiguous ways that you do Python code. Um, It'll happen automatically, it will fail you, and it will give you errors like this. Um, and then you have to go back and fix them um, before you can get past Jenkins. Um, this has been so successful on the Python side. We have a few OpenStack projects that are written in shell, and we're actually writing a shell equivalent tooling for style issues like this. Um, it, this is about saving uh, code reviewers time because, and mental energy. If all of the nitpicky stuff just happens by a tool and you have to get through the gauntlet before someone looks at your patch, um, that saves uh, me as a code reviewer a ton of time. Um, unit tests. So um, the next class of failures, and that actually the, the example I showed you, what it was failing was unit tests, um, exactly why I don't know. Um, OpenStack is a very deep test culture. It is part of a, a foundational principle that you do not deliver code without tests to test that functionality. Um, and so if you look at any project, if you look at Nova, the lines of code of unit tests in the tree are about the same as the lines of code of, functional of, of function. Um, so it's like half test, half function, um, which is a good place to be. Um, these tests, for most of our projects, were the test running infrastructure we've moved to is uh, a thing called a test repository, tester for short, um, which is a test runner runner, and there's complexities around that. But what's most important is that we are running these unit tests in parallel. Um, and it means the order of them is not guaranteed. The order of them may change over time. And the fact that you have multiple unit tests running at the same time. When we converted to this, we found that people were actually very, very bad at writing isolated unit tests that did not corrupt some other test state, um, which becomes very evident when you start running in parallel, because things now do or do not work depending on which ran first. 
Um, when you fail a unit test, when the unit tests fail, you kind of you start looking at these in the following order. Did you just write bad tests or bad code for what you just landed? Or did your code break existing validation that was there for a reason? It is probably your code. If it's not your code, it could be your tests doing this thing where it corrupts some global state, or it could be somebody else's tests that we hadn't ferreted out yet. Um, and um, there, or it could even be this other class of things where because we're running all these things at the same time and sometimes you do need to manage global state within these unit tests, like you might actually need like legitimate locking in unit tests, which is supported. Um, Tester itself actually has functionality um, if you run it explicitly called analyze isolation, which will start with all your tests, hit a failure, figure out all the tests that were running in the group, then start bisecting and get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller to find the smallest set of things that you run that still generate a failure. So that should let you understand that these two or three things are coupled in a way that they should not in any way be, and then you can debug from there. Um, now, the, these first sort of three classes of things that we talked about, these are relatively straightforward. You know, this kind of test you know, is somewhat isolated to a single environment. And um, it's relatively easy to run all these things on your laptop. Um, you should just run the tox jobs on all the projects that will run the style checks and the unit tests before you push. But as we've talked about, right, OpenStack um, is a whole lot of projects. This is not even all the, th this is the OpenStack architecture circa Grizzly, where we had seven integrated projects. Um, and each represented by one of these big boxes, and each piece in between is some um, moving part of that project, be it a daemon, a required queue system, or a required database system. Um, and they all cross-talk all the time. And while we do care that any particular project by itself is not broken, OpenStack is an integrated thing. Right? We call them integrated projects for a reason. What we actually care about is that all of OpenStack, when it runs together, works the way you expect it to work. Um, there's a lot of complexity here. There is also a lot of interesting asynchronous behavior that happens when you have this many demons that are largely communicating via a queuing system which is asynchronous to one another with message passing. So. On every proposed change of any of the, the integrated projects, um, we run a series of integration tests where we actually stand up a cloud and ensure that it all works. Um, and this sort of, the flow of how this works, um, I'm going to go through and, and then start to figure out what the artifacts look like afterwards. Um, so Zool is this project that uh, was created as OpenStack technology that is our gatekeeper. It is a way that can manage getting multiple Git trees with multiple upstream references um, all built into a system, and then we can stand it up and, and do interesting things with it. Um, everything that we do in OpenStack, we do in OpenStack clouds. So we're running either on Rackspace or HP Public Cloud. They have very generously provided us with lots of cloud credits um, and don't really ask how many um, clouds we build. Or they do ask, but they don't, they don't beat us up for it because um, we do a lot. Um, so on every proposed change, <coughs> we go and um, we hit a cloud and we bring up a guest and we put DevStack in it. DevStack is an opinionated development install tool for OpenStack that pulls down all of the projects from Git and starts all the services as a single node cloud. So it's a somewhat synthetic environment. You know, you don't really, in a real production environment, you're not going to run all the services on one place. Um, however, for certain simplicity reasons, um, this is the way that we're running the system now. Um, there's a project called Tempest, which is <coughs> our integration suite system. Um, that's part of the OpenStack QA program. Tempest is 1,400-ish, um, depending on the day. Uh, API tests across the whole slew of, of OpenStack integrated 
projects, as well as a set of things we call scenario tests, which are um, building up a complicated state environment for a cloud, be it a couple of guests or volumes, a particular workflow, and ensuring that that works end to end. Um, all of these things, Tempest only touches the OpenStack API. It is, uh, treats OpenStack as a black box, um, and that's important because the behavior of OpenStack should be defined by the API surface and not by underlying implementation details. Um, the, so it, over its course of its run, will start bringing up guests. Um, it will start tearing down guests. It'll bring up other resources. Um, and over the course of its run, um, it will, I think, uh, in our sort of maximum configuration, we, we bring up over 120 guests over the course of a DevStack uh, Tempest run. Um, and at the end of the day, then it spits out a whole bunch of output about how, what happened? How did this work? Did all these tests pass? Um, uh, 30 minutes. Yeah. We have done some substantial optimizations to the guests themselves are very, very lightweight that we bring up second level. Um, what? I'm not sure I got the question. You, we're starting second level ver guests, right? We're, we, are, we are running as guests in a cloud, and so all the guests we create are actually their QMU guests, their second level guests. Yeah. Yes. Yep. Um, so this is sort of basically just what I talked about there. Um, the artifacts. <clears throat> so there were all those links that were shown in a Garrett commit, um, and uh, or a Garrett comment back when, when Jenkins reports, those links are links to, uh, law, to somewhere in log.openstash.org um, where we have all of our logs for every single run that we do. Um, we generate somewhere around a terabyte of compressed data per six months of OpenStack, and we keep the last six months of all the runs um, for historical and trending issues. Basically, we know, we keep every test run from the last release. Um, and <clears throat> what this ends up looking like, um, if you have to start going deb debugging a failure, um, at the top level, you have the console output that happened. Um, you have the test results in slightly prettier HTML format. And you have this logs directory. And the logs directory contains logs for every single service that was running through the environment. We run all of the OpenStack services at debug level when we're running these tests so that we have the highest level of tracing um, that we can for understanding an issue that happens. Um, our intent here is a, uh, a first fail data capture so that you should be able to debug a Tempest failure in the gate just from this set of artifacts. And if you can't, well, then the artifacts are wrong, right? Um, at the end of the day, um, this ends up being you know, very similar to if you were an operator and something goes crazy in your cloud. If you can't figure out what that is from the logs we provide, that's no good. Um, so we impose this same restriction back on the development team. We have the logs. You better be able to figure it out from them. If you can't, we have to fix how the logging is happening for that project so that you can. Um, there is a sort of general pattern to figure out what's going on here if it fails. Um, when you're reading through the console, the first question is, did you actually ever get as far as the Tempest tests themselves? Did you manage to actually break um, a project with a patch in such a way that a service didn't start, right? Those, the basic setup. So the, the bulk of this console file is actually the dev stack installation process, which is running at like a, a bash tracing level. So it's a huge amount of output, again, for first failure reasons. Um, secondly, it did, did it fail during a Tempest test, right? Which is actually probably where it's going to fail. It's, it takes a lot of work to break OpenStack at a fundamental level for the installation. Um, and when that happens, um, you sort of have an outside-in model to go look at. Um, you know, first, go look at the API service where things failed at. Um, if, the, if the 
class of service also has a scheduler. Like the scheduler may be very well to blame. Like maybe you blew a resource quota, maybe you blew something else in your test. And then dig deeper, like in the Nova case, you know, getting down into the CPU, uh, Nova compute itself. Um, did something happen? Did you end up actually breaking the way libvert functions? Um, and dive into there. Um, reading these Tempest logs, these console logs, are, um, is not always the most fun thing in the world. Um, however, <coughs> uh, so, so we're going to talk about it a little bit. Um, basically, this is what lines of Tempest output is. This is a failure from a week ago. Um, there will actually be, you'll see the full test name in here, and then somewhere in here it's, it says it's OK or it failed, right? OK. So um, how do you get from this failure to where was the interesting part in the logs? Um, for the Tempest runs, we are running them. Uh, for all the Tempest configurations or dev side configurations in the gate, except for Neutron, um, we are running uh, parallel testing, which means that we are hitting OpenStack simultaneously with four tests at once um, all the way through. And, uh, in, and this is a relatively new change for Havana, where we're actually running everything in parallel. Um, in order to run them in parallel, what we're actually doing is we're running Tempest in what's called isolate, in tenant isolation mode. So for every uh, test class, we actually build a brand new tenant in your cloud um, using the administrative API that um, for all the tests in that test class. Um, this is the only way that you can run safely in parallel because um, if you were letting your tests sort of run all over each other, what you would find is that um, you know, the resources within one tenant could be stomped on by tests in another thread. So this way, we ensure that um, when we're running four different things, they're actually running as four different tenants, so they will have defined resources. Um, if one tenant could go affect another tenant's resource, that's a huge security problem in OpenStack. So we are relying on this fact as, as part of our uh, prevention of race conditions in our, in our tests. Um, because we create new tenants for every test class, and most OpenStack services at their logger level include the tenant ID of the request coming in. Um, you can actually match the test class name, which will be the one that's in funny camel case as part of the string, into the logs itself. And so if this is the test that failed, you can start going looking through Nova logs now. Um, and you're looking at Nova because this was a compute API test, so it's probably broke somewhere in Nova. Um, and you know, here's the relevant logs um, that are there. And realize like these requests here are actually probably a different test entirely because we're running four things at once. So the, the, you're not going to have only your test, uh, only the test that you're looking at in the logs, right? This is a real environment. We're running multiple things at the same time. Um, so debugging Tempest itself, a Tempest fail is actually oftentimes quite hard. Um, it's, we do try to get enough data so that we can do first fail uh, capture and be able to let you debug everything from the logs, but realizing that there are definitely places in OpenStack where you don't have enough data at this point to do that. So if you're running into problems trying to figure out what happened, it's not deducible from the code that you pushed, um, that uh, step one is Local replication. Um, the project which sets up this whole test environment is called DevSec Gate. And there's actually, within its readme, there is uh, documentation about how to uh, replicate exactly that environment in like a local VM so that you could run this and, and ensure that it's there. Um, you can also try to run smaller subsets of this to figure out you know, whether or not it's like all the tests or just a small set to try to isolate again like what went wrong. Um, and moving forward, we're actually trying to make this whole problem better. One of the biggest problems um, is the fact that logging between projects is not entirely consistent today, um, which is something we need to do better at. And um, there's a few of us that have kicked off this log normalization um, work 
over the course of Ice House to try to at least build some common standards and um, some common patterns so that we can make this um, a little cleaner by the time we get to the end of Ice House. Um, we're also, there will be a design summit session later in the week just talking about other ways that we could possibly increase the debugability of this scenario. The last class of things that I want to talk about, um, because this is probably the one that um, is least understood by people, is Grenade. <coughs> um, on every patch, we have this tool called Grenade, which is for upgrade testing. Um, and I'm going to walk through the workflow of what it does, because um, realistically, it's reasonably complicated. And you know, last night over dinner with some of the other uh, core folks, it took us many tens of minutes to explain the scenario that we were having and a particular failure condition that was happening within it. Um, Grenade itself uh, is a project that uses DevStack extensively. Um, what it does is, um, let's pretend this is the week before Havana release. <coughs> um, it would, when you ran Grenade, um, it would first use DevStack to start a stable Grizzly version of OpenStack um, using the stable Grizzly version of DevStack. So first we start the last stable release of OpenStack. Um, great. Then we run um, DevStack itself includes some basic e exercises, which means that uh, to let us just ensure that the thing looks like it started correctly. It's not like extensive testing, but it's just like, OK, we look, we look vaguely sane. Um, then we have this, this uh, custom thing called Javelin, which is setting up uh, a small number of resources in the environment which we expect to survive the upgrade. So that means that we're starting you know, a VM, we're starting some volumes, we're starting some specific network security groups, whatever. We're changing the state of the environment and state which should be in exactly that same way once we've completed an upgrade. Um, and if it's not, that's no good. Um, we then shut all this down. We shut down the control plane. All the resources are still running, but we shut down all the OpenStack services. Um, this is not an online upgrade model. It's an offline upgrade model. Um, Everything's down. We make sure everything's down. If we, if, it, if we failed to shut something down, then clearly we have a different class of bug, and we have to deal with that too. Then we start a second DevStack cloud. And this would be, you know, again, a week before Havana released, this would be on, um, on the master branch. Um, but differently than the first time through, um, we don't reinitialize the environment. Your database is the database that you had. We don't overwrite your config files. The config files are the Grizzly config files. We have a deprecation rule in OpenStack that says you can't just pull things out of the configs. You have to deprecate out over one full release. So that option, if you want it to go away, you have to flag it deprecated, and you have to give it a release, and then you can remove it. So a Grizzly config should work in a Havana environment. It will give you lots of warnings. It will say, this stuff's going away. You have to go fix it but it won't, it should not break you. Um, and uh, now we do realize there are edge conditions where, where like full everything in a Grizzly environment will not necessarily roll forward to a Havana environment. So we do have a mechanism for exceptions. And in a lot of ways, the, the small number of exceptions that we land in Grenade, um, which you uh, are, code as documentation for the incompatible things that you would have to do a manual change to OpenStack to, to do the uh, upgrade. Um, our intent is to make this zero. It hasn't been zero yet, but because for you at this point to land an incompatible change in OpenStack, you would actually, you, you would get failed at this point um, and then uh, you, would have to, you would have to convince us to let in the incompatible upgrade bit into Grenade before you could go land in a project. Um, we are pretty hard on people about that. Um, once we're up, we make sure everything in Javelin is still running. Um, realistically, the first time we did this, it was not. Um, you know, and your VMs need to survive when you're upgrading your cloud, um, as do all your other resources. <coughs> um, 
And then we run Tempest, the same Tempest we run in the normal run. We run not all the tests, but we run what we consider a good representative um, set to exercise what's going on, and that's mostly for time reasons. Um, we have found that when, when the test runs become very long, there become some other issues that, that happen um, in feedback to the developers. So, so there are time budgets here, but we, we get pretty good coverage on this. Um, debugging Grenade is a lot like um, debugging a Tempest dev stack, except we're thinking about we have two trees for dev stack. We have an old and a new. So at this top level directory, um, there's a bunch of other files related more specifically to Grenade, but then there's also all those service logs for all the services in OpenStack. There's, there's an old, which is what happened on the old side, and a new, which happened on the new side. So you can see the difference and figure out like, what was appropriate in there. Um, realistically, the biggest issue that this prevents from landing is thing, incompatible changes to configs. Right? You know, we had as principle for a long time that, um, we, that you had to deprecate out config options, and um, people didn't always do it. Um, for the set of config options that we actually are important for running an environment like this, we now have some enforcement to ensure that they do, um, which is a good thing. Um, it, yes? How long does the grenade test run take? Uh, 24 minutes-ish. Um, because we don't run all of Tempest, um, we actually, it's about 10, it's, it's 10 to 15 minutes of doing the grenade part, and then 10 to 15 minutes of doing the Tempest part. I don't remember which is which. Um, What? Um, we have. So Grenade itself right now is actually not running. Not all the integrated projects are part of the Grenade testing today, um, which is a limitation. Uh, you know, first of all, yeah. So in Grizzly there were seven integrated. Um, however. Um, uh, what is not, Neutron is not in here, and we don't test Horizon. Um, yeah. Um, the Neutron issue, we are definitely fixing an ice house. Um, we will make Salometer and Heat get in here, um, but, you know, it's lagging a little bit. Um, not as of yet. Uh, we've been talking about that within the, the sort of TC model about what we would add there. Um, but w w let's take that conversation offline afterwards, because um, there's a couple more things, and then maybe we'll hit questions quick at the end, being the end of the day. Because um, the last thing I want to talk about is the fact that this is a really complicated environment, which means that you might push some code. It might be fixing a typo in a comment, and your job fails which means you can guarantee that it was not your code that failed the job. Um, complex, massively complicated asynchronous environments have race conditions. Um, that's the nature of the beast. And um, with as many moving parts as OpenStack has, um, there is a class of those in there. Um, so if you push a code change and you've gone through all the mechanisms and, and you say, no, 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 I'm sure. I'm sure this is not my fault. Um, we have an escape valve for that. Um, we let you put a special comment in the Garrett review, um, which is recheck bug and the bug number that it is, um, which is important that you went and either found an existing bug that was representative of this race condition, or you went and filed a new one yourself. Because that data is important to us. Um, we actually try to keep track of those things off of status.openstack.org. We have this rechecks tab, and this is um, based on the content that people put in there. These are the classes of race conditions that people are seeing in the gate when they show up, um, and um, we're trying to categorize them that way. Um, and a bunch of this comes to the fact of just sort of the rule of big numbers, right? Um, this is one week of OpenStack CI. Um, we build 25,000 clouds a week as part of our normal process. 
we billed half a million guests as part of our normal process over one week, and this was not a busy week. This was a week post-release planning for OpenStack Summit. So, so consider this volume is probably double in some of the critical points of release. Um, when this happens, um, you get some interesting things going on, which is that um, you get scenarios where maybe a particular race condition shows up in one out of 2,000 runs. But if you are running our throughput and doing 3,000 runs a day, that means we're seeing that thing you know, every 15 or 16 hours. We get an event that's that event, that's that particular event. Um, this starts to become something where we can now start accumulating a lot of data about particular race conditions showing up, how often they are, and what are the worst ones that we're seeing. Um, so r during the Havana freeze cycle, we actually started building this cool little new tool. Um, we, um, six months ago, we started using Logstash to, we pipe all of our, uh, our test data through Logstash. Um, which is a tool which is a, it based on Elasticsearch and it lets you do searching on your logs in like a natural search engine way. Um, what we then built is a small thing called Elastic Recheck which goes and um, has a hand curated set of queries that people have figured out this Logstash query actually is that bug. Like that bug can be uniquely determined by this log stash query. So when anything fails, we immediately run through all our queries and figure out if we know what the bug is. Um, and then we categorize it. And that lets us build these sort of dashboard elements, which we used very heavily during the Havana release, to figure out like what is killing us right now. What are the race conditions that are actually our most problematic issues? And to focus the development teams on them. Um, I, I actually don't think we would have got through Havana release successfully without this. We saw a bunch of issues creep in kind of late, and this gave us this incredible focus to get down there. This is what looks like when someone fixes a race condition. It just flatlines out. We stop seeing it anymore. Um, and, and because we have enough volume, we can really see these events um, show up all the time. Um, this. Uh, this is one of our you know, sort of cool new pieces. Going forward, this is going to become even more important to the overall OpenStack um, process. Um, so with that, I'll give you a couple of links. Um, some things about how the Garrick workflow works, the, the Garrick Jenkins environment. Um, I tend to write about some of these issues around OpenStack, um, the QA process, and some of the things we're doing on my blog, dig.net, and, and you can follow me on Twitter. Um, with that, I think we have two minutes left. So if there's a final question, I'll take it. Sure. Yep. Um, so that's a sort of that's a long, complicated question. Uh, why, don't, why don't we take it as a offline discussion afterwards? I'm not sure I can give you a concise answer. OK. Let, yes. Yes. So, th so that's true. Like the, we build patterns over time where we realize that certain behaviors within OpenStack projects, like everybody talking to the same database at the same time um, all throughout the cluster, is a bad idea, right? Yes. Right. Um, yeah. So, so, so. Let me get off mic and we can chat more. It's harder, to, it's a little harder to hear up here. Any other final questions?
Um, so no, no provider, no cloud provider today provides nested KVM. Um, my understanding is there are general concerns by many of the cloud providers that nested KVM functions correctly on load. Um, and the reality is our guest boot time for the image we're using is like seven seconds. So I don't think that getting, um, the only difference between QMU and KVM is, is the IO instruction path is much slower. But we don't actually generate a lot of IO when we do these boots. And so I'm not convinced that going. Um, yeah, I, I think there's not as much difference as you think for the environment that we have, given what we've optimized for. OK. Thank you, folks. And uh, thanks.